Hi, my name is Julie Leidner and I'm the museum educator at the Carnegie Center for Art and History. And we are an art museum and a history museum. And today we're gonna to be doing an activity that combines both of those things, art and history together, in an activity that I call an egg of a different color. So before we get into our egg tempera paint making activity, first sit back and watch a slideshow that I called Weird Colors, where you'll learn a little bit about the history of how some of your favorite colors were discovered and made. I think you're gonna see some things that are a little shocking in there. So after you watch that slideshow, meet me back up on the other side and roll up your sleeves, put on your aprons, and we're gonna make some egg tempera the historic way that artists did 500 years ago. Are you ready? All right, I'll see you guys soon. Hello and welcome to a short history of weird colors with Miss Julie, that's me, from the Carnegie Center for Art and History here in New Albany, Indiana. And as I said, we are a museum of art and history. So we love having the opportunity to talk about the way that those two things overlap. And that's what we're gonna do today when I tell you about the history of some colors that are pretty weird, guys. Yeah, so are you guys ready to hear about these colors? All right, here we go. The first color I want to tell you about is mummy brown. Now imagine it's the late 1800s, you're an artist, and you walk into a store to buy some brown paint. One of your options on the shelf will be a color called mummy, or in some cases it was called caput mortem, which is Latin for dead head. Now you might not actually think if you're that artist, that it was actually made from mummies. But the truth is, it was. There was a color in the late 19th century and early 20th century that was created by grinding up the bodies of mummified people that they would have found in old temples um, or old tombs, for example, in ancient Egypt. Now, you might think to yourself, well, that's disrespectful to the dead, and that's disgusting, and that's wrong. And you know what? That's what the artists thought, too, when they found out that their paint, Mummy Brown, was actually made from mummies. They stopped using it, and eventually it became illegal to make Mummy Brown or to sell Mummy Brown. Now you'll see on the right there's a painting that used some of that mummy brown color and artists liked it because it created this nice brown, um, almost sort of a translucent brown color for shadows. So nowadays and later in the 20th century, they started making a fake version of mummy brown in a, in a laboratory to look like mummy brown, but it wasn't actually made from mummies anymore. So uh, if you are in an old attic somewhere and you find a dusty old trunk and you open it up and there's some old art supplies in there, keep an eye out for an old tube of mummy brown because what you have in your hand might be the real deal. Does anybody know what that picture is in the very middle of the slide? Well, it's a bone. This is a picture of a burnt bone because that's what ivory black used to be made from. Now, ivory, we know, is made from the tusks of elephants. And back in the old days, they used to burn those tusks that they would take from elephants and turn it into this black powder or an, uh, an ash and they would turn that into paint that they would call ivory black. Now it doesn't have to be made from elephant tusks, it could be made from other types of bones. So bones that were left over from the beef industry um, of cattle and cows or any other kind of bone. Nowadays, bone black bone. 
nowadays, bone black um, could also be made from the char of wood. Um, now, a piece of bone like the one in the middle there would probably take about 24 hours to burn completely into a ash, but wood burns much more quickly than that. And actually, wood can turn into charcoal, which can be ground down into a black pigment that would look a lot like ivory black. On the right there is a Rembrandt painting that used ivory black. Um, we don't know whether that ivory black was made from elephant tusks or from other types of bone, um, but we do know it's ivory black and you can still buy that in stores today. Now today ivory black is most likely made synthetically, meaning in a lab, but back in the old days of course they would use real charred bones or wood. Cochineal bread was invented around 200 BC in South and Central America by the ancient Mayan and Aztec people. And as you can see in the center there, it was a type of bug that lived on cacti. And when you squished that bug, it would let this bright, beautiful, pinkish red liquid come out. Now, it wasn't just their blood. It, this beetle itself actually did have it, as its body a pigmented red color. And when they smashed those bugs down and gathered up um, a whole heap of them, they could create a dye. And then they would dye things like yarn, um, as, as the picture shows there in the bottom left corner, and create these beautifully um, richly pigmented red textiles and fabrics. So the type of beetle was called a cochineal beetle and it created cochineal red. Some people call it carmine red and guess what you guys they actually still use this in stuff today. Yeah so you see that lipstick there on the right? Some lipstick is still made with carmine or cochineal today, and yes, it is still made from beetles. In fact, some beverages that we drink like Big Red, and you guys like Big Red, guess what you're drinking? Yeah, it's made from cochineal bugs. So while they we don't typically paint with cochineal red anymore, it is still a part of our lives in certain products. Um, but that was a really beautiful color um, to create fabrics and textiles and paint with. Indian yellow is a color that was also derived from animal origins, but instead of being bugs like with cochineal, it's actually derived from a liquid that comes out of cows. So what liquid comes out of mammals like cows that is yellow? Do you need to think that hard about it? You're right, it is urine or pee. So there is some evidence that suggests that around the 1400s, artists in India were using Indian yellow paint, as we call it now, that was derived from cow urine, which they would boil in large vats until it was thickened and it turned into this sort of dark, was thickened and it turned into this sort of dark, syrupy, golden liquid that they turned into paint. So that center image there, that's the kind of deep golden yellow that we come to know as Indian yellow now. And it was thought that these these cows would eat mango leaves, which would help turn their pee even more yellow than it already was. So can you imagine how stinky that would have been to have this giant pot boiling of uh, cow pee? Well, it created a beautiful color, so I guess it was worth it. Now, today, you can find Indian yellow as a paint color in stores, but it's not made from actual cow urine anymore. It's made in a laboratory, but the color that it is is basically inspired by that color that they created in India from cow urine. So you can think about that every time you go to the store and see Indian yellow. 
Those of you who are watching this slideshow that have played the video game Minecraft might have heard of Lapis Lazuli, which uh, is a stone that is be a beautiful blue color, and it means beyond the sea. Now, it was discovered in caves in Afghanistan thousands of years ago, and it even shows up in King Tut's sarcophagus, as you can see on the left. It was a very, very precious stone because it was even more rare than gold or diamonds. So you can imagine how expensive it would be to find the lapis lazuli and grind it down and turn it into a pigment for paint. In fact, it was so expensive in the Renaissance that even famous artists like Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci could barely afford to use it. It had to be purchased by rich patrons so that they could paint with it. And the center there is Girl with the Pearl Earring, a famous painting by Vermeer. And he was really a popular artist in his time. And so somehow he managed to get his hands on some of this um, lapis blue paint. And you can see it's painted there on her turban. So ultramarine blue is what we call it now. It's kind of the color that we know of um, when we think about the color of lapis lazuli. But it's a very famous color and um, yes, known for being extremely valuable. Now Tyrian purple is a color that has probably one of the strangest histories that I've heard of. It came from a type of creature that lives in a shell. As you can see there in the center, the types of shell that this creature lived in, and uh, it's a snail. And uh, in the ancient Rome, artists discovered that if you took hundreds and hundreds of these specific types of snails and put them in a big pot and boiled it down, kind of like boiling down the cow urine for Indian yellow, but in this case, boiling down snails that they pulled out of their shells, this particular type of snail would create a beautiful purple color. And there's stories of people who lived in the cities in Italy where they would create this this color and they would talk about how bad it smelled even from miles away they could smell them it smelled even from miles away they could smell them boiling these snails down but they did it anyway because as you can see on the right they could dye threads and fabrics in this color and create a purple color. Now, it was really expensive to make this because they had to find so many snails to put in the vat and boil it down that it costs a lot of money. And because of that, the fabric that they made from this color was worn almost exclusively by royalty. So that's why when we think now of royal purple, really that's in reference to the type of purple that these kings and queens were wearing that were dyed in expensive Tyrian purple. It also was used as a paint color. And on the left, there is a Michelangelo painting there that has a little bit of Tyrian purple in the fabric there. Um, nowadays, um, you know, once once uh, people started making paint in larger quantities, they watered it down a little bit. They watered down the, the snail Tyrian purple color because it was so expensive. And the watered down color, like the lighter color of it, is known as mauve. Uh, which you've probably heard of today. Now today we don't have Tyrian purple anymore as a paint color, but it lives on in history. Out of all the colors that we've talked about today, phallocene or fallow is the color that was always made in a laboratory. This is our artificial or synthetic color that we're talking about in this slideshow. Nowadays there's lots of synthetic colors but phallocene was one of the early colors that was invented in laboratories by scientists in the early 20th century and it became really popular in the 19th 1980s 
because Bob Ross loved it and would always paint with it on his TV show, The Joy of Painting. So that's Bob Ross there on the right. Some of you may have watched his show where he creates happy little trees and mountains and lakes and skies and all kinds of landscapes. And you'll hear him put fallow, either fallow blue or fallow green, there's both kinds, on his palette and paint with it. So it's a really bright color of green or blue, um, almost in some cases kind of neon. So it sort of does have that look of a scientific made in a lab type of color. Um, but yes, fallow blue and fallow green uh, is an interesting color because it was one of our earliest synthetic ones. Now that you've heard the history of several colors, I want to tell you about a historic type of paint, specifically egg tempera. Egg tempera was really popular in the medieval times and the early Renaissance, as you can see on the left two pictures, one of them being by Duccio di Bonosegna, a medieval artist, and the other, an early Renaissance artist, Sandro Botticelli. They painted with egg tempera, and it was made out of egg yolks. The practice became a little bit less popular when Practice became a little bit less popular once they started painting with oil paint uh, and then eventually acrylic paint in the 19th century and the 20th century. But some artists still chose to paint with egg tempera, like, for example, the artists on the right two pictures, Louise Marionetti in the 40s and Jacob Lawrence in the 1960s. And they chose to paint with egg tempera because it was a beautiful way of creating luminous colors. So it would create kind of a, a shiny, satiny look to the paint that artists loved. And it was best painted on wood panels. So nowadays, when we think of tempera, we think of a, a type of synthetic acrylic paint, but you can still make your own egg tempera at home. And we are gonna learn how to do that right now. So if you are a teacher and you're teaching this in your class, make sure to check out the supply list so that you know exactly what you'll need to pull out for this activity. And it's all using ingredients that you can find easily in a grocery store or at home even. So, so pull up your sleeves and let's get to making some egg tempera. Hi folks. If you watched my slideshow about weird colors, you would have learned some historic ways that people made colors hundreds of years ago. And right now, I'm going to show you a recipe for a way of making paint that artists used hundreds of years ago. Except we're gonna do a little bit of an updated version for ingredients that we can find today. But um, I wanted to show you a little something. Take a look at that beautiful magenta color. Can you guys see that? This is powdered cochineal, which if you watched the slideshow, you will learn what cochineal is made out of. It's made out of bugs. And yes, this is the real deal. So artists would take a pigment like this and they would grind it up into a paste and they would mix it with egg yolks. An egg yolk would be a binder that would bind that color together with a little bit of water and liquid, and it would create a beautiful paint. So that's what we're gonna be making right now, except instead of using powdered pigment, we are going to use gel food coloring, which is very easy to find in the grocery store nowadays. It comes in these little tubes, and it's kind of like its own little paste. So, okay, you guys ready? Let me go through the checklist of things that you need. You're gonna need eggs. You're gonna need some little plastic bowls or paper bowls, and this is gonna be for each egg and for each color. We're gonna make one color per egg yolk. You're gonna need plastic forks, a bowl of water with a spoon in it, 
a little cup of vinegar. I have distilled white vinegar, but you can probably use white wine vinegar. And of course, you're gonna have to have your gel food coloring. And you're gonna have lots of baby wipes and paper towels, because this is gonna be kind of messy, y'all. And on that note, you know, wear a painting shirt or an apron. And then you're gonna have some paint brushes and some sturdy paper, like watercolor paper, for when you have made your paint. Oh, one more thing. Have a little trash receptacle nearby, guys, because we are gonna be throwing away some parts of the egg, and it's messy, like I said, so you wanna have this trash bag really close at hand. Okay, I think that's everything. So, first step. The first step is that we need to get an egg yolk into this cup. So, we know that the egg has the white and the yolk, we're gonna actually be getting rid of the whites of the egg. So you can, when we do this, you can put your whites of your egg in your trash can, or you can save it. And when everybody has their saved white um, egg whites, you guys can make meringue or angel food cake or something like that. Um, but yes, you're gonna be putting your yolk into this cup. So I'm gonna show you how I do that. You might want to watch me first before you do yours. Unless you're an experienced cook and you've done this lots of times before. So I'm actually going to take my ring off. And some people separate their eggs with a little tool like this. It's an egg separator. So you can use that if you want. But I'm just going to use my bare hands. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my egg and gently tap it on the edge of this bowl. If you have a flat surface that's metal or marble or something, you can, you can tap it against the table. But I'm gonna tap it against the edge of the bowl and I'm gonna be very gentle because I don't want to crack the egg yolk. We want the egg yolk to stay nice and whole. Okay, so gently. See, I barely, barely cracked it. I'm gonna do it a little bit more on another part. Very, very gently. You see that sort of crack that's appearing there? Yeah, see that. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm actually gonna take the trash receptacle and place it underneath my egg. Now, if you guys are all doing this in a group, you might wanna do it one at a time. Okay, so I'm gently, gently opening up this egg right at that crack and I'm letting the egg whites fall so I want the egg whites to fall into the receptacle and I'm gonna tip it into my hand like this okay so this egg this egg shell is getting thrown away it looks like I have a little broken egg yolk I broke my egg yolk but that's okay I'm gonna show you guys that it's fine. I have a broken egg yolk, but I'm gonna pour that egg yolk into my bowl. Now you might see that there is a little white stringy part. That is called the, uh, the caleza and it's just a part of an egg. And what I'm gonna do is actually gonna pull that out because we want our egg yolk to be really smooth. So I'm pulling that out and I'm throwing that away. Now there might be some other bits of the skin around the egg yolk that kind of makes it a little chunky. And if you can see some of the skin, you can sort of fish that out with your hands too. I found another piece of the chile the caleza, which is again, it's kind of just like the um, like the whitish thin skin around the yolk. I'm fishing that out. I want my egg yolk to be really smooth. Okay, so I'm gonna set that aside, and I'm going to crack another egg yolk. I'm gonna wa wipe my hands with my baby wipes. I'm gonna crack another egg yolk and see if I can do it without 
breaking the yolk. Wish me luck, guys. Here I go. All right, taking my egg, and I'm gently, ever so gently, cracking so that I have a little crack there. Okay, let's try this again. I'm going to carefully pry it open at that crack. And I'm gonna tip it into my hand again. All right, so far so good. Now what you can do sometimes to get that white to kind of dribble down into your trash can is just to tip it back and forth really, really carefully from one hand to the other and let all the whites drip down. Okay, so I have a whole egg yolk here, but I still have some of this caleza and some of this membrane around here. So I'm gonna show you a trick for getting that off. Now this is something that maybe the older kids, might be a little bit better for older kids than for the younger kids, but um, it's a way of getting the smooth egg yolk out of this membrane. Put it on a paper towel. Do you see how I gently put it on that paper towel? And now I'm going to really, really, really slowly roll it to the side. What this is doing is it is drying the egg yolk. It's kind of messy on my hand, so I'm gonna Take a paper towel and wash my hand a little bit. Wipe my hand a little bit. So here is kind of a cool trick, guys. I'm moving in the trash can. I'm gonna take the white bowl that I want this yolk to go in. I'm gonna place it here. And with a dry hand, so I have one hand holding this egg yolk in the paper towel. I have the other hand that's been kind of cleaned off with somewhat dry fingers. I'm going to grasp this egg yolk, pinch it. So now it's pinched and it's over top of the bowl. So I'm going to squeeze out the yellow yolk from the skin that it's in. Squeezed it and I basically I pierced the little skin sack that it's in so that it all kind of dripped out and now I'm holding that little skin sack with the white piece in my fingers and I'm gonna throw that away all right so now I have two cups with egg yolks that was the hard part guys so take this opportunity to, to wipe your hands, really the hard part is over. Wipe your hands clean. And now is where we get to add the color. So I already have made a blue and a red and my gel food coloring pack came with blue, red, yellow, and green. So I'm gonna make my yellow and green out of these two cups. So what I wanna do is for each bowl with my egg yolk in it, I'm going to squeeze. Well, first I need to open the cap. My hands are still a little bit wet. I'm going to squeeze a sort of like a blueberry size um, dab of this gel food coloring into the egg yolk. This is where my fork comes in. So with your fork, you're going to stir that into the egg yolk. Look at that brilliant bright color. If you want it to be a lighter color, just put less food coloring, but you want to get them it really stirred up so that there aren't any chunks of food coloring, just like floating around in there. Once you got that stirred up, I'm gonna take the spoon from my bowl of water and I'm gonna put just a little bit of water in there. 
I'm gonna stir that up. It makes it a little lighter when that happens. See, see it turning a little bit of a lighter green. You still want it to be pretty thick, but not so thick that it's really gloopy. That's why we add a little bit of water, just a little bit. And then, last ingredient is a little bit of the white vinegar. So I have my little cup of vinegar and I'm gonna put just a drop. I'm just gonna put a little drop in there. And what that does is it actually keeps the paint fresh for longer. Because guys, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but sometimes eggs have kind of a stinky smell but after, a, after a long time. And the vinegar helps keep it fresh. So look at that beautiful green paint. Okay, we're gonna do it one more time. I'm gonna wipe off my fork or you can get a fresh fork. We're gonna do one more time with the yellow. And you might be saying, Julie, why are we doing this with the yellow? Because the egg, egg yolk is already yellow. Well, that's true, but we want the, our yellow to be even brighter. And it is true that the yolk kind of colors some of the paint slightly, but ultimately it doesn't really add that much yellow, the yolk does. So we want our yellow paint to get an extra dose of yellow from the food coloring. So just stir that in really well. And then we add our little bit of water, stir it up again. So it's a nice medium thick consistency for paint. We add our little drop of vinegar to keep it nice and fresh. Stir it again. Set it aside and now, check it out guys, I've got yellow, green, red, and blue paint made from eggs. So here's the part where you get to be really creative. You're gonna take out your, your thick paper. And if I were you, I would have a different paintbrush for each color. And you're going to try painting with your beautiful color. Now, if the color is not as bright as you want, you can add a little bit more food coloring. But the thing about egg tempera paint is that even back in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance when people painted with this, what they would do is they would paint in thin layers. They would paint in thin layers and sometimes they would let the layer dry and then paint another layer on top. It wasn't the type of paint that you just like pile on gloopy. It was meant to be beautiful, thin, transparent layers. So my blue is a little thin, but you can see how beautiful these colors are. And when it dries, I'll show you what it looks like. When it dries, you can see the sheen, how it's a little bit shiny. It's like satin or silk. It dries to this beautiful luster. And that's what people love about egg temper paint. It's like you can walk up to a painting and see it almost kind of like come alive at the surface. Um, if you want a little extra exercise, you can try mixing the three primary colors and create a brown. Because if you guys watched my slideshow, you will have learned a little bit about mummy brown. So I'm gonna show you how to mix brown. As you might know, the primary colors are three of these four. Which one has to go? Which one's the secondary color? Smarties know that it is green. So red, yellow, and blue are our primary colors. And when you mix those together, you get brown. So what I'm gonna do, you guys can do this too if you want to have a little extra fun at the end, is I'm gonna 
pour a little bit of each of my primary colors into a bowl. You could experiment too with mixing secondaries. That made sort of a purple. Then we're gonna add a little bit of the yellow. And voila, we have brown. This looks like melted chocolate. I have to say brown is probably my favorite color. And so there you have it. You have sort of a brown that looks like mummy brown in addition to your red that looks like cochineal red, your yellow that looks like Indian yellow, your blue that looks like ultramarine blue, and your green, which you could consider to be a phthalo green, just like the colors that we learned in the slideshow. So, everybody, I hope you enjoyed learning about egg temper paint. It's so much fun um, to see the way that you can actually make your own art materials from scratch. It makes you feel um, like even more of an, of an artist when you can not only create a beautiful painting, but create the paint itself. So, hope you have fun with this. And um, if you have any leftover egg yolks, like I said, maybe make some meringue or make an angel food cake out of that. Um, we don't want things to go to waste. So, hope you enjoyed this activity and have a wonderful rest of your day.